Hello, my name is Nobel Dabra. I'm a faculty in the Department of Leukemia at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. I focus on clinical trials in acute myeloid leukemia, myelodysplastic syndrome. And today it's a pleasure for me to speak on the topic of which AML patients benefit most from venetoclax treatment. So this is a very open-ended or broad question. You know, venetoclax, uh, in my opinion, in the last 20 years is probably the most impactful therapy to have entered the acute myeloid leukemia space. Uh, of course, the most excitement and interest and the common use of venetoclax currently is combination with hypomethylating agents, uh, azacitine to cytopene, and that's where in AML setting, venetoclax in combination with hypomethylating agents has shown significant improvement in all parameters, CR, CRI rates, CR rates, EFS, and OS compared to uh, HMA alone in the Viale A study, which established HMA venetoclax as a frontline optimal therapy for older unfit AML. Now that question of older unfit AML, I think is, is, is the big question. I get uh, emails on every day from treating physicians, community doctors, even academic centers as to who we would use HMA venetoclax in. The trial was done predominantly in patients who are above 75 years of age or below 75, but with a clear documented comorbidity, organ dysfunction, either cardiac, pulmonary, liver, hepatic, other. However, once people saw the CRCRI rates of 67 to 70% with a good durability, especially in certain molecular subsets, there has been a shift even in patients uh, 70 to 75 and even between 65 to 75, where if a patient has borderline fitness, but maybe does not have a very clear documented pulmonary hepatic issue, there's interest to use HMA venetoclax based treatments. To me, I think the best way to select um, this regimen versus others is using the uh, molecular landscape or the leukemia characteristics rather than focusing on the patient age fitness, which is highly subjective. We know there can be a 72-year-old marathon runner fit patient who could look like he's 55, and there could be a 55-year-old patient who may have multiple comorbidities and issues who could look like he's 72. So I think uh, using the subjective age fitness is very difficult. There may be some absolutes where it's easy above 75, below 60, below 55 fit patients, but for most, I think, what is their underlying mutation in cytogenetics? And in our group and in many large centers in the US, we are preferring HMA venetoclax-based therapies for patients who have high-risk adverse cytogenetics or TP53 mutations, irrespective of their age. And the reason for this is not because we think HMA venetoclax is better than cytarabine anthracycline-based therapies, but because they seem to be equivalent. The response rates with HMA venetoclax in TP53 mutated now have been presented from three different data sets showing about 50% CRCRI, about 20, 25% true CR, which is very similar to what has been published multiple times with different cytarabine anthracycline data. And the survival is about six to eight months, also very similar to what is achieved with intensive chemo. So if a patient is going to have a similar response and a similar OS, which is poor with both of those groups, we would prefer to do a therapy that's better tolerated, causes less GI toxicity, less uh, reduction in quality of life, and more outpatient time. And this is why HMA Ven is preferred in that population. Now, there are other drugs that we hope will actually improve the outcome and bring an efficacy argument rather than non-inferiority, such as maybe CD47 antibodies like macrolimab or APR or NK cells for TP53, but those are not yet standard all in clinical trial. Then we come to the other side of the spectrum, the good actors. So we now know that uh, IDH1, IDH2, NTM1 splice mutation, and maybe RUNX1 mutation seems to have a very uh, favorable response to HMA venetoclax. CRCR rates are close to 80% or more. Durability is good at two and three years. So if I see a 70 year old or a 69 or 68 year old who's kind of in the borderline area, maybe has some comorbidities, but is not truly unfit using the Ferrara criteria, would I want to subject that patient to three plus seven intensive induction with a 10 to 15% early mortality plus additional comorbidity for a response rate of about 80, 85%? Or would I go to HMA venetoclax, which has much less comorbidity, early mortality less than 5% in good experience centers? And again, a similar CRCRI rate of close to 80% with even a similar MRD negativity based on emerging data in these molecular favorable subsets. So even for those patients, NPM1, IDH1, IDH2 splice, if they're close to 69, 70, our preference has been to do HMA-VEN as we know a lot of them could do quite well in the long term. 
So then you have the middle population. These are the difficult ones, you know, people who have mutations that are neither sensitizing nor clearly adverse TP53 adverse cyto. And there, I think we have to decide based on the patient profile. If they have a FLIP3, we often prefer at our center a FLIP3-based triplet on clinical trial. Some of these are being used already uh, outside of trials. One has to be very careful with myelosuppression. However, they are very effective and if done in experienced hands with good monitoring could give us good outcomes. Uh, if they have IDH mutations, we would consider adding an IDH inhibitor to HMA panetoclax. We already discussed TP53. There are two groups where intensive chemo may still be the preferred choice, even up to 72, 73 potentially. And this includes core binding factor in version 16, 8, 21. These patients have a very high sensitivity to uh, cytarabine based treatments and intensive chemo is still our preference. We use a flag gemtuzumab based approach. Others use 3 plus 7 gemtuzumab. Here we're talking about five-year survival rates of close to 80%. We do not have that kind of data with HMAVEN uh, in any subset or that long follow-up. So I would still use cytarabine even in patients who are older in that population. And the second group that one could debate is in the NPM1 with or without FLIP3, where again, we have a high sensitivity to cytarabine and robust five-year data from the ratifying, hopefully soon from the quantum first, where there could be up to 55, 60% patients alive at four years. So these may be the two populations where intensive chemo is still my preference, but then for all the others, as we discussed, we're moving more and more towards HMAVEN. And at MD Anderson specifically, we don't see HMAVEN as a uh, watertight therapy on its own, but adding to the HMAVEN with FLIT3 inhibitor for FLIT3 mutated, IDH inhibitor for IDH mutated, CD47 or other antibodies for TP53 mutated, cladribine based backbone for some others. And we think that at this, uh, with these approaches, maybe HMAVEN could start approaching the MRD negativity and long-term survival of intensive chemo, but that has to be reviewed in larger prospective studies which are being planned. So uh, I think that's a kind of a summary of how we select patients for HMA venetoclax-based um, treatments, but I think it's a uh, you know area of investigation that is still under evolution. And I think in four to five years, we'll have even a clearer idea with some of these potential triplets or sequential approaches emerging. And uh, hopefully we will be able to replace uh, with the good efficacy, intensive chemo in many subsets of patients, which would then improve hopefully quality of life, time outside hospital, uh, and overall outcomes for AML. Thank you very much.